Good morning. This is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Teacher with Parrots. Today is June 21st, Sunday morning. This is our morning service. I'm at the moment live on iBlog.tv with our Sunday morning Bible study class. So, uh, okay, thank you. So I'm, I guess you call it multitasking, trying to do two things at once. At the same time, I'm recuperating a little bit, so I'm not quite as fast and up and at it as I usually am, but um, we'll overlook that. This morning, I want to talk about holiness and sanctification. Words are usually used together to some people they mean the same thing and the definition of both of these words is very similar. If I get time this morning, and I probably will do a shorter uh, version of my regular program, if I get time I have a little very simple non-complicated object lesson. If not, I may just continue the same program into the next video or this evening's Bible study, and in which case I'll use it then. Okay. What is holiness and what is sanctification? Is it an Old Testament thing? Is it a New Testament thing? Has it changed in the last, how people have preached about it in the last 200 years? Or is it the same? What are the churches that emphasize, because all churches believe in holiness, all churches believe in sanctification. Some call it by a different name. Some have a slightly different interpretation but we all believe in it. The word holiness is, means exactly what it says. Being holy. Being without sin. Or something can be given the name of being holy because either God or we treat it with respect and consider the special meaning it has. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle and everything in it was holy because God said it was. Now all the furniture in the tabernacle was made out of chicken wood. The inside furniture was covered with gold. The outside, the labor and the altar, were covered with brass. There is nothing holy about chicken wood, gold, or brass. But God gave directions on how to make something. And how to use it in worship. And he made it holy. And because he did, it had to be treated with respect. You will remember that when the ark was being moved on one occasion, uh, the animals pulling the cart stumbled or something, and the ark started to slide off the cart that was carrying it. Sometimes, for some distances, it was carried on the shoulders of the high priest. But sometimes, long distances, when they would travel and the whole tabernacle would be taken down and folded up, it was carried on a cart. Well, the cart shook, the tabernacle started to fall, Somebody reached out and touched it. 
you don't treat something that's holy the way you treat everything else. If God has made something holy, it demands another kind of respect. Uh, special treatment. In churches, if you're familiar with the vocabulary, many churches have a school and a playground. Many churches have a kitchen, a dining room. All churches have a sanctuary. That's where the preacher preaches and teaches. And the people worship and praise. So there comes the name sanctuary. Very close to the word sanctification. Words and I can remember from years back, I got out pictures um, that were taken of my ministry in the 1950s and I posted them on Facebook just before our district council for all the people who remember, because uh, there are still some of us around, that far back. Some of our churches were little, they were humble. You couldn't put your purse down between you and the person next to you on the bench or the pew, because the church was full. Sometimes it wasn't all that busy. Do we have a guest or did we have one for a minute? <laughs> I move my eyes and I come back. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, probably intended on going someplace and being entertained and found out, wow, who's that old lady? <laughs> okay. Um, but they were the sanctuary. Kids didn't run. Babies didn't cry. That room Although sometimes in some places the windows didn't even have window glass. They were so humble and so poor. But that was the sanctuary. In a regular church building, if they have a playground or so, children play. If they're having a dinner and they eat there, and this has been going on since Acts chapter 1, all Christians getting together uh, near a place of worship to eat together. And uh, children play, move around, it's sanctuary. That's different. The word sanctify means to make something holy or to set it aside for the use of something that's holy. Um, not many churches anymore have organs. I was, I wasn't the only traveling evangelist with an instrument. Guitars and accordions were the big theme when I started out in the 50s. And then I got an electronic piano, which was in the 50s, which was very, uh, looked somewhat like uh, the keyboards of today, except it just had one tone. You could, get a lot of tones out of it like you can out of an organ or an accordion or a keyboard. But then, at the, probably about 1958, I bought a Thomas organ. It had only one keyboard, but you could divide it in half and you could get one thing on this half and one thing over here. And some of our churches were so happy because we had an organ in the church. Now, when somebody is playing an accordion or a guitar or even a keyboard, if it's something they bring back and forth during church, um, 
that's different. But when the church would buy an organ or a piano or build a baptistry, they would dedicate it to the Lord. I got a picture taken in 1954 of a 1954 light blue um, necklace that we bought. Because we went many places where there weren't people who knew how to work on American cars. So that we have a picture of, of the pastor who started the church. The revival began the church. He started making arrangements, and then we had the revival, and a church was born. We went the next year, and it was a big church like every other church in the area. But in those days, evangelists dedicated their equipment, their car, exclusively for the work of God. It meant we weren't going to use that for our own purposes, but for the work of God. Many organs are dedicated for the work of God. Churches are dedicated for the work of God. The Catholics do something I think is rather interesting. And I'm in favor of it. If they build a building and dedicate it, sanctify it as a place of worship, and then the day comes when they build another building someplace else and they're going to move, they de-sanctify the building. In other words, making it okay to do something else in the building other than preach, pray, and worship. So, something that is holy is free of sin or has been declared holy by God. He said, be ye holy as I am holy. Now wait a minute. We're all going to have a little difficulty trying to live as holy as God is. But God did not say Perfect holiness, perfection. Use the word holiness. I went to a holiness Bible college for five years. And I did some postgraduate work in a holiness college. And I don't know if they've changed since the 1950s. But I know very well, in great detail, what they taught in the 1940s and the early 1950s. I had a wonderful college president, Dr. Harry Jessup, at the Chicago Evangelistical Institute, CEI. I had him for one class, but mostly we got great sermons on Sunday. He tried to explain perfection. Another name among the holiness people for sanctification and holiness is Christian perfection. I remember I was 16 years old. I could barely understand, let alone challenge anybody. But he taught, and as I told you before, I'm going to be using, uh, you know, I thought, oh, it's up there. I brought some stuff to use for an illustration. He brought an illustration to class one day. Now, in those days, this, is in, this was 1947. I'm 16 years old. In those days, men wore pocket watches. And in those days, pens had an opening here and you poured ink in it. And then you wrote. 
until it ran out of ink and then you put more ink in it. And he got out his fountain pen and he pulled his watch out of his pants pocket. And he said, I'm going to give you a lesson on Christian perfection, holiness. He said, see this watch? And he had the best. He was a great man of God. He was loved by so many people. If he couldn't have afforded the best watch, I guarantee somebody would have given him one. He was very revered and respected. He got up his watch. And he said, you see this watch? Because in those days, you had to set your watch. They didn't run on batteries. You wound them up. But you had to set them every day because none of them were perfect. And you could do that once a day uh, with some service that would come on the radio and tell you at an exact moment when it was a specific time and if you really needed to have perfect watches like if you drove a train or something like that uh, you could you could set your watch he said look i never have to change this watch i tune in it's perfect it's a perfect watch and he said see my pen perfect pen it doesn't leak because in those days and this was before plastic. Later, when uh, uh, ballpoint pens came out, some men would put in the pockets of their, uh, of their shirts a piece of plastic so that when they stuck their pens down in their shirts, it would get on the material in their shirt. But this was before plastic. And he could put his in his pocket because it never leaked. The fountain part didn't leak, and the bottom part you screwed on come, it never came loose to make the, the, the um, pointed part uh, re retain ink and get on you. He said, so here I've got a perfect watch, and here I've got a perfect pen, but my watch doesn't write letters and my pen doesn't tell what it's um, uh, my pen does not tell time and my watch does not um, write There is a belief, and I can't tell you what the holiness churches believe now. Welcome to mom. Uh, I think this is the first time you've been in my show. I'm not going to chat with you right now because I'm also making a video of this, but after we turn the video off and you're still around, we'll chat. I'm going to tell you what the doctrine of their main leader, who was John Wesley, is. Because I told you I was going to talk about holiness and sanctification. It's a bit complicated if you've never heard of it before. It's not that complicated as you have. But I want you to have a full awareness of it. The term Christian perfection, he used the pen and the watch to explain that Christian perfection is not absolute perfection. So while Christians may strive for being as holy as a human being can be, as long as Adam and Eve are our forefathers, we're going to have a sin problem. It's called original sin. And you're not going to find in anybody, the most consecrated, you're not going to find absolute perfection or absolute sanctification or holiness. But, according to him and his example of the watch and the pen, 
Christian perfection is doing what God made you to do. As long as the pen did what it was made to do and didn't leak and create a problem, it's a perfect pen. As long as the watch gave good time and didn't make you late or make the train you were operating late, it was a perfect watch. But a watch is not a pen and a pen is not a watch. John Wesley, the head of the Methodist Church, and thereby all the churches that are associated with it, like Wesleyan Methodist, Free Methodist, Holiness Methodist, Church of the Nazarene, all other holiness uh, churches, and then there's other churches that don't use the word holiness, but like Church of God in Christ, uh, and other churches are known for this belief. John Wesley, by the way, his brother was Charles Wesley, who wrote hundreds, maybe thousands of songs. And every time I see a song, a hymn, and I see certain language in it, like Second Blessing, uh, I know that it is Charles Wesley's song. Charles Wesley taught two works of grace. Salvation through faith for the, for the forgiveness of your sins. And sanctification as a second work of grace. This is how he explained the second work of grace. first work of grace, of course, would be salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, giving you entrance into heaven. Then what was the second work of grace, also referred to sometimes as the cleansing? This was their best example, and I'm not criticizing it. I went to their schools. They were my mentors. I don't know any finer people in the world. The holiness people were looking to get closer to God than they already were, and they discovered the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And a whole new movement of Pentecost and gifts of the Spirit, and so forth was born. They are wonderful people. I have a little intellectual problem with second work of grace. They believe, as do we, that when we ask forgiveness for our sins, we're pardoned, we're saved, we're forgiven. Obviously, that's a work of grace. It's nothing that any of us can do. They said, but that original sin, that thing that is in us, you and me, that makes us sometimes want to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing, that makes sin more fun than sanctuary. That's in everybody, but it can be taken out. They explain it like a tree. I should have brought a plant. I have enough. I could have brought it. They explain it like a plant. When your sins are forgiven, all the branches, all the leaves, God comes and chops off those branches and leaves when he forgets you. But you've got a root in the ground. And as long as that root is in the ground, you're going to have a sin problem. So sanctification 
The second work of grace is taking that root out of the ground. That's flawed. Um, much as I love the people, and much as there are people who are dedicated to being closer to God, more full of God, more used of God, that's not, in my opinion, biblical. Uh, it's not possible. I've always been very sensitive. As a child, I was. If I did anything wrong, I felt so bad. And I can't tell you every time I criticize somebody or had a thought I didn't think was pure, man, I was running down to the altar, Lord, forgive me. And I, boy, if that root was ever taken away, it came back all the quick. But that's what sanctification is. Taking something and dedicating it to God, whether that's an organ, a church building, or you. Dedicating yourself to God. And each day pleasing Him more than you please Him today is sanctification. Separating something. Taking it out of an environment of sin and putting it in an environment where you want to serve God and worship God and while you're not going to get perfection on this earth become more like him than you were yesterday um, holiness is perfection. If we attain a certain amount or kind of holiness, it's limited to that which human beings can attain. I want show you with an illustration how you can start working on holiness, on sanctification. Now, first of all, sanctification, you, it, it talks about separation. Remember in the Old Testament, in our Old Testament lessons, God told the people, I've got a land I'm promising to you. That's the promised land, which we now know as Israel. He said, I'm giving you that land, but you have got to go. And all the people that are living there, you've got to take them out of there. You've got to separate yourself from every other human being on earth. You can't hang out with your neighbors, the Moabites. You can't hang out with your neighbors, uh, what's one of the other <laughs> neighboring countries that is now Jordan. Uh, Mount Seir, Edom, you can't hang out with those people. You have to separate yourself from them. If you hang out with them, you will become like them. If you separate yourself from them, you will become like I want you. See, I don't waste my time giving people a long list of what is sin. Don't do this, don't do the other, don't do the other. Look, it either pleases God or it doesn't. 
if you want to please God, you don't do the things that God is not pleased with. So I'm not going to give you a name, give you a list of sins. God will do that every time you start to do the wrong thing. If you really want to live for him and you start to do the wrong thing, Holy Spirit will be right on your shoulder telling you what you shouldn't do. Um, he told them, do not leave, not even one person in the promised land. Mary has been uh, with um, preaching with parrots for a long time. I think Larry's probably been through that Old Testament going into the promised land twice. Once several months ago and once a few years ago. And I'm just mentioning Larry because he's here today. There were a number of others that are often with us. Sunday morning is not our biggest, um, uh, our best attended uh, Bible study. So, to be like God, you can't be like ungodly people. Now think about love. Some people get married for love. Some people get married to use somebody else. Or they're married because somebody else is using them. They get married for strange reasons. Sister Rose had a sister that didn't drive and didn't have a car. So she married a guy that did. <laughs> I know, that sounds totally stupid, but it's true. And he was her cousin. I, I was talking to a young woman and she felt her husband had fooled her before they got married because he professed to be a little more spiritual than it turned out he really was. And I said, yeah, and you did your hair up great every day and you dressed great every day and you smelled good every day. How do you know that? Well, number one, I'm a woman. Number two, we always want to present our best side to somebody we love. And sometimes our best side is not our true side. And God said, you have to separate. That's sanctification. You have to, if, if the people over here are going to sin, you've got to get away from them. Because they will drag you into their sinful life. I'm not preaching against anybody. I'm not telling you who to have for your friends. Just telling you. You want to be sanctified? You want to live a holy life? That doesn't mean at work, on a coffee break, you can't talk to somebody. No. It means people you choose to spend your best time with and choose to confide in and choose to be close. They're going to pull you away if they're not seeking what you're seeking. So if you want to be holy in God's sight, you want to be used of him, you have to separate yourself from him. Let me give you this quick illustration, and I'm going to close for this morning. And I will continue this evening. Okay. Here we have glass of water. Here we got an empty cup. Not very costly. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> teaching tools. I want to fill this cup with water. That's why this is a little bit larger. Here we go.
Can you see this? Let me get it a little closer to the cameras without getting it all over the computers. Okay. It's full. That cup full of water is you. You want to be full of God. How are you going to do that? What's the first thing you're going to do at the end of this program to get closer to God? Well, I got news for you. God can't get in this cup. I can't put any milk in there. I can't put any coffee in there. Because it's full of water. I can't put anything in there until I take out some of the water. Now that I've taken out some of the water and I'm trying to get it on both cameras, <laughs> now there's room to put something in it. Here's the big thing. And this is not going to sit well with a lot of my Christian friends. With some preachers I know. If this is full of water, you can't put any milk in. And if this is full of you, you can't put any God in. We got people that are full of themselves. In our country, there have been cultures and groups of people that have been made to feel like second-class citizens, like they weren't important. That's not good. Because God loves them as much as he loves us. They are as important in, to him as we are to him. So making somebody a second-class citizen is not good. In order to bring them out of that second-class citizen feeling and make them feel worthy, because we're all worthy, we don't have the same talents, we don't have the same ability, but we're all worthy. We started to teach our kids, you're somebody. God made you and God didn't make junk. So the kid says, yeah, I'm somebody. Now I'm going to cut through a few years here. When dad says, you're 18, get a job. Well, I don't have to. You're not my real dad. <laughs> I could go on. In trying to tell people we have worth, we've made some people feel they're all that. You can't correct them when they're wrong. You can't give help when it's needed because they're somebody. And if they happen to have gone to college and they're an attorney or a doctor, or a scientist, then they're really all that. They're full of themselves. And as long as you're full of yourself, there ain't no room for God. So in order to make more room for God, you have to get on your knees if your knees bend after 
well, 75, 80 years old, your knees have a little trouble, but you get before God. And you say, and this is sanctification. This is the road to holiness. Lord, less of me. See, if I pour this out right now, it's half full. If this is half full, I can put half of something in there. If it's empty, I can fill it 100% full of God. So you start emptying yourself of yourself. What you want, what you think, what your opinions are. And you do this through asking God to help you. None of us are smart enough to know how to do this without a little help. God, I want to empty myself of me. Of course you empty yourself from the things you know are sinful. Of course you empty yourself of the things God tells you are wrong. But in addition, you know, we all think we're pretty hot pretty cool, depending on what generation you grew up in, whether you think you're hot or you think you're cool. We all think we're somebody. If we don't think we're somebody, at least we want what we want instead of what God wants. This is the beginning of real biblical sanctification. Of real, that's separating yourself from the things of the world, but from the things you want. Just, okay, if I'm going to have God in my life, there's not room for that. There's only one me. There's not room for what I want and room for what God wants. I think I've said enough on the subject. Our video is 43 minutes long. Hang on, uh, those that are with me live, and let me close off the video and we'll chat a little bit. We'll be back uh, on our live class this evening, and we'll be back on video probably this evening too. So until our next video, blessings on you.